Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. So today I'm going to show you how to do this Thanos smoke portal effect with Typhlo for the little lightning and then Phoenix of D for the smoke effects. So let's set it up from scratch. It's a pretty simple setup, so I'm going to try and do it as quickly as I can. So I'm working in units, centimeters. One unit is one centimeter. We can start just by creating a torus in the middle of our scene, make it about this big. It should be pretty thin. Rotate it and raise it up. And if you sort of look at it, the, the bottom of it should be a little cut off because that's where the ground is. So we can sort of leave the bottom of it, maybe something like this, and then hold shift and drag and copy this one like that. Maybe we can raise the thickness of something this. like this. So radius two, and then maybe we can do 10 shift. and move it back here. Helpers point and just make a point and then make it a box. And I like to make it some other color than green because it's the color of the Phoenix box. So let's make it maybe orange and let's align it to the torus. And then I'm going to link the torus to the point. And that's just because I want to be able to control the torus with the point. Then let's make our timeline longer. So 200 frames for now. And then go under material and create a new map. And let's make it a noise map. And then you can lower the high to maybe 0.6 and increase the low to maybe 0.4, which will just give you more contrast. And let's apply that material to the torch just so we can see what's going on and hit show map in viewport. And then we need to decrease the size of this to maybe five and go under, click on the torus and go under the modifier panel and add a UVW map. And you can just leave it as planar. Hit auto key and animate the face of the noise from zero at frame zero to 25 on frame 200. So now, pattern of the noise will keep changing over time like this. Turn off auto key, go under helpers, Phoenix and create a PHX source and add the torus. And then before we forget, click on this small one, go to object properties, make it not renderable, display as box. And then right click again, go to Phoenix FD properties and make it not a solid object. And then under the source, let's give the outgoing velocity maybe 75. So this is the strength of the smoke that's going to be coming out of this torus. So 75 is a value that I found to be, uh, you know, not too much, but not too little to get this kind of violent smoke. We can turn off temperature. So we can raise the amount of smoke to be two. And then uh, we want to grab this map that we get created kind of for the torus smoke. and we say copy and paste it can raise the smoke, smoke to be map two. and say then instant. We want to grab so basically, wherever the mask is black, there will be no smoke emitted. And wherever it's white, there will be smoke emitted at full strength of two with 75 for outgoing velocity. So as the map keeps changing, you're going to get this randomized sort of pattern of smoke bursting out at different points around the torus. And also set the noise here to four, which will just randomize the outgoing velocity of the smoke even more. And then we want to go under helpers Phoenix and create a body force and set the strength to 1000. And for the attraction object, let's pick this small torus here. So we're gonna emit the smoke from this big torus and it's going to get attracted to the small one. And that's how we get this funnel look of the smoke going to that smaller point. So I also wanna add a turbulence. So let's do PHX turbulence. Leave it at strength 200, but with 50 centimeters for size. And then we can create the Phoenix grid. So standard Phoenix fire and smoke sim. And just make a grid like that. Grid and set Z as jammed minus so that the ground of the simulator or the bottom will act as the ground. And we can raise the Z like that. And for the resolution, one centimeter cell size right now is fine. You know, about three million total cells is okay to start. And then I raised it to about eight million from my final simulation, which ended up looking like this. 
but you can give it as much resolution as you want. You can leave it simming overnight if you want. So under dynamics, we can raise smoke dissipation to about 0.4. So this value goes from zero to one with one being that the smoke will instantly immediately disappear. So 0.4 will just make it sort of thin out and sort of look like it's about to disappear back here. The darkness and then I actually left everything else at default and then just go under output and make sure that you output velocity. I, I did render this with motion blur which helps sell it a little bit. So just pick your path here and then let's simulate a few frames and make sure that this is actually working. All right, so I ran this for 50 frames and everything's looking good. You can go under preview and turn on the GPU preview so you can see the funnel. Click on this torus, go to object properties and make it display as box and not renderable as well. So if I go through my timeline, this is basically our effect as it stands right now. Now, the way I rendered it, basically there's no lights back here, so the smoke just sort of vanishes into darkness. So I know that I'm making it look super easy, but obviously I've already gone through the pain of trying all sorts of different numbers to get this kind of an effect. But the numbers that I just gave you will give you exactly this effect here. So let's just say that we're happy with this as it is, so we can just hide Phoenix for now. And one more thing that I want to do is let's make this display normally again. And I forgot to animate it. So let's just select this control point and set it as it is on frame 50 and go back to frame zero, hit R and just scale the torus down. So that's how we get that opening in the beginning. And then, you know, I added a quick flash of optical flares from Andrew Kramer and it lasts exactly 50 frames so you end up with that opening just like this and you can select the point hit the curve editor and set the point type to auto which is basically smooth so it will give you a curve and it will slowly stop as it's growing and now we're going to use tie flow to add this little lightning sort of going through the funnel so hit r and hold shift and drag and copy this torus and let's name it our emission torus and you can go under materials and maybe give it a red material just so we can differentiate it and make that a little larger than the first one so maybe four and you can scale it down a little bit just to match the other one tie flow create a tie flow object go into the editor and let's drag out a standard birth and we want to emit from zero to 200 per frame and we want to emit about 20 particles per frame and then let's add a position object because we want to birth those particles along the surface of this torus here. So I'm gonna pick our red emission torus and we have some particles being born. And now we basically need to attract those particles to this small torus again, just like we did with the body force. So with die flow, you do that by using the find target operator. So let's drag that out here. And for our target, we want to pick this small torus here. So now we have that funnel again. That's a good start, except the particles don't die. So we need to add a delete operator. And we want to delete the particles based on their age. And then you can just drag this range until you have them about where you want them. But what I actually did, I just increased the variation because I don't want all of these particles to, to reach the end because it's supposed to be sort of just flashes of lightning. So the particles should, some of them should die sooner than others. So I just raised the variation to about 40 and maybe you can lower the range again and then maybe lower the variation a little bit. So we basically want the particles to die around the time when they reach the torus back here. So now our portal sort of gets born and the particles are moving along with the smoke to the small torus and then they die. 
Now we need to give these particles shape and make them look like lightning. So we can just add a shape operator and drag it under the find target. And you can make it 3D for now and just make it grass long, which is as close to lightning as, you, as you'll get. And then we can go under display and make it geometry. And we need to go back under shape and hit scale and maybe scale this up to 500% so we can see it. So now we have these little pieces of grass for now. And let's go under the material and go to standard V-Ray and let's do V-Ray light material and make it sort of like a cool blue and maybe with a five intensity, apply that material straight to tie flow. So now they're blue. Now they're all sort of facing the same direction. So let's add a rotation operator here. So now they have random rotation. So this is what we have right now. And what you can also do is add a spin operator and put it under rotation and maybe set the spin rate to like a thousand so that they keep spinning also on top of having a random rotation in 3D space. All right, so now let's just make something to replace this grass with. So we can go under splines and just create a line and just make a few sort of random points to make it look like lightning. And then you can just play with the vertices a little bit. Maybe delete this one. So something like that. And then let's go into rendering and enable in viewport and in render so you can see how thick it is. And that looks fine. So let's just right click and make it an editable poly. And then you can go under shape and just remove the grass and add selected. Hit the scale size again and make it maybe 10. Okay, that's too small, so maybe 20. Okay, I think that's that's about where I was here. And a lot of these will disappear into the smoke right away, so don't worry too much about, you know, what happens back here. You're never going to see that. You're only going to see a few of these around. And, um, you know, you can always just duplicate this, make it a little different and add it in here so you have more variation. All right, so now in order for us to be able to render this out, we need to add a mesh operator down here. And now we can just go under standard lights and add a few V-Ray lights. All right, so with the V-Ray light, you can set the multiplier to maybe two and then under options, make it invisible and hold shift and drag and make one more, rotate it 180 and then hold shift, make one more and maybe put this one on top. And for this one, you can lower the intensity to maybe one. And then let's unhide Phoenix. So we have our smoke in here. And then maybe we can go under the rendering settings for the smoke. So you would just go under rendering, volumetric options, smoke opacity. And I think I raised the opacity to maybe 0.7 just to make it look thicker. And then under smoke color, I think I made it more black. So something darker like this should work. And then one last detail we want to add is that blue sort of light glow on the inside. So I just made another V-Ray light. And this one you can just make a sphere. And I think I set the multiplier to about five and make the color blue like that. And then everything will turn blue because of the GPU preview. So you can go back into Phoenix go under the GPU preview and here you can click exclude and just exclude that last light and say okay so it will not be shown in the preview so not everything will be blue and then you can just move this blue light basically in the middle of that funnel so about there should be pretty good and I'm just looking at this view right now and you can just you know see where it's at so basically in the middle like that and make sure that it's invisible. And now we can just come over here. And for my quick rendering settings, I'm just using V-Ray Next, um, Bucket 2 and 4 for the sub diffs and 1000 for light cache, that's fine. And let's give it an HD resolution and hit render and see what we get. 
All right, so this is the render as of right now. It's very close to what I have here. Now, obviously, I added some curves and color correction and After Effects to make this pop a little more. But you do have this basic render looking pretty good. I think the lightning is a little too bright. So you can go back in the material and maybe lower this to just one. And then what you can do is go to your render settings under render elements and add a V-Ray self illumination pass, which will basically just give you a pass of just the, the lightning. So this is what that pass will look like. You will get just the lightning by itself which then you can use the add transfer mode to add it on top of the funnel and you can go and do effect, stylize, glow and just you know add some glow to to the lightning which can be pretty cool but I actually didn't use this pass at all because I really liked it being very subtle and not drawing too much attention to itself just a few little lightning bolts here and there but mainly the focus is on the smoke and one more thing that you can do is go under standard V-Ray and make a V-Ray plane drop it in here and then you want that to be slightly above the ground sort of penetrating the smoke a little bit so maybe like that into the grid and that will just give you a ground so that the lightning sort of isn't here on its own so you can just go back into the material and make a sort of bland gray ray material with no reflection which will just make it faster to render and apply that material to the v-ray plane and now let's just put our camera in place and see what we get all right, so this is very close to what was my final result. I just think that the light here gives you this sharp thing. So let's just, what you can do is move the light up and rotate a little bit just to get rid of that sharp edge and move it more sort of higher up above the funnel. And then I think that the light inside is a little too bright. So you can just select that light again. And maybe let's lower the multiplier to just two. And you can basically just animate your camera, run the Phoenix simulation, and, and that's about it. And then when you bring it into After Effects, basically all I did was I added this optical flare in the, in the first few frames. And then I cranked up the curves to give it a lot, this nice sort of brighter edge. So really a very simple setup. So I hope that you guys will try and do this effect on your own. I would love to see your results. I would appreciate if you could leave me a comment, you know, letting me know what tutorials do you want. Underwater footage tends to be bluish, have volumetric light, both from on-screen sources and from above frame. The camera is often handheld or floaty, and the motion of objects is slow. The footage is also generally murky. Things fall off the farther they are away from camera. And lastly, sometimes the image can appear wavy or distorted. Now how about the elements that tell you we're underwater? First, we've got our floating bits, just a bunch of little particles swirling around. We see caustics or light ripples that dance along various surfaces. Perhaps fish or other animals may swim by. And underwater foliage is usually sprinkled around and grows around stuff. Moving objects create bubbles that either enhance their motion or float to the surface. And to create your underwater look, you can use some or all of the things on these lists. It depends on the shot and your art direction. Now let's dive in. You're going to want the right type of footage. Pools of light in a dark, foggy environment work best. The brighter your footage is, the more challenging it may become. Daylight exteriors are a no-go. If you're using stock footage, like this awesome material provided by Pond5, you're going to want something like this. Something dilapidated might lend itself to looking like the elements have taken their toll. If you're shooting your own material, here are several suggestions. Use a darker, sparsely lit area, especially with top-down lighting. Fog machines work wonders. They can create a soupy feel and add volume to all of your lighting. Plus, they're pretty affordable. Heck, go buy one the week after Halloween when they're on clearance. 
kick it on and then waft that fog around so it's more uniform. Now, all your light sources will have cool volumetric light coming off of them, just like in water. If you want to get fancy, you could even get a projector and project caustic patterns onto everything for some practical effects lighting. This would work the best from the top down if you can manage that in your space. I'm using my garage for this demo, so I'm lighting it from the side, but at the very least your kids will get a big kick out of this. Film at a higher frame rate to take advantage of slow motion. It's harder to move quickly underwater, and if you have an actor involved, frankly it becomes a lot less believable if they can move around too easily. And those are the basics for getting some good material to start with. Now let's dive into After Effects and get our feet wet. I'm going to convert these three clips into some fun underwater scenes, and after that I'll show you the template I cooked up for you guys based on what I learned along the way. The beginning of this tutorial will show you how I honed the underwater look step by step. I'll get detailed and I'll also provide some useful After Effects tips along the way. But if you want to skip ahead to my summary of the downloadable template, you can always use the table of contents in the description below. Now let's start with clip number one. I got this staircase footage from pond5.com. It's a simple, like, dirty environment, the staircase, the caked up dirt along the side of the stairs will really help sell that underwaterness. I'm going to use that list we made earlier as a rough guide for what changes I should make to this footage. My first step is almost always to motion track the footage. Once I get a good result, I set the ground plane and origin. I create a solid and camera here too. I continue to use the plane creation tool to put stand-in planes on all of the key surfaces. Then I'll label these too. These locators will be really helpful once I start placing extra elements within this environment. And with that, it's time for pro tip number one of this episode. Normalizing your 3D world. You never know what the scale of your 3D tracked world will be. Sometimes it's reasonable and sometimes it's astronomical. So I like to use this little trick. Once I'm sure I've created all the planes and locators that I need from the camera tracker, I normalize the whole 3D world. And it's actually very simple. Step one, use the widgets to align your ground plane visually with the footage. The green Y widget should be pointing into the distance and the red X widget should be pointed screen right. Step two, parent all of the 3D objects, including the camera, to your ground plane. Step three, open up the position of your ground plane and set it to 960 by 540 by zero. Step four, set the orientation to 270, zero, zero. For a standard HD comp, this means that your ground plane is centered and properly oriented so up is up, down is down, and left and right are square to the world space of After Effects. And then for step five, we need to adjust the scale of the 3D world. I do this by creating a solid that's the size of the comp. I make it 3D, but leave it unparented and scaled to 100%. You'll notice that it should appear right in the center of my ground plane. Now, if I open up the scale of the ground plane, I can adjust it up or down until that solid is about the same size as my frame, just roughly. Once that's done, I can unparent everything from the new ground plane. Now this 3D scene is what I call normalized. That means when I import a new piece of footage or create a solid or text item, they'll appear right in the center of this 3D world, oriented properly and easily moved in X, Y, and Z space as defined by After Effects. This will save me the time of repositioning and rescaling every piece of footage I bring in. And it's also really helpful for any plugins that utilize the 3D space. Particle effects like Particular and Form will be really happy. And 3D effects like Video Copilot's Element will have a great head start when you create. And now on with the episode. Color correction is the next step on our journey. As a starter, I'm going to apply Magic Bullet Looks. After shopping around, I settle on the classic hot and cold look. Pretty neat. Next, I'll add trap code shine to create some volumetric light. I'll slide it up in the effects stack, and I'll also select the aqua light preset under colorize. 
Next, I can tell Shine to use a 3D light as its source point, and then create a light called Shine 1. By pushing this light back in 3D space, I can create the illusion that the light's coming from some distant point behind this building. And this is already looking great. Now, the brightly lit trees outside this window are kind of bumming me out, so I'm going to create a copy of my back wall solid, rename it to Window Mat, and then do some slight repositioning and draw mask shapes in these windows. With a few simple keyframes and a subtract mask to block them from when the staircase occludes them, I can switch this layer into an adjustment layer and throw a fast blur and toner effect on them. Now these windows still function as a light source, but it's less obvious that there's like trees and stuff out there. Now jumping back into Shine, I can utilize the fractal noise pattern to make these light rays look a little bit more organic. I'll select the 3D light with parallax and use the cutout blending mode. Next, I'm going to add CC Vignette. It'll just make the space feel a little bit more mysterious and dark toward the edges. I'm also going to dive back into Looks and play with the S-Curve module a little bit. And there we are. That about covers our full checklist for the Look category. And now it's time to add a few elements to help sell the idea we're underwater. Let's start with the floating debris. Trap code form is just perfect for this. I'll add a solid with form, and then open the designer window to get a head start on the look. Let's select the cloudlet particles and create a box grid, adjusting the number of particles on the grid until we have a kind of uniform look. I'll add some randomness to the size of these particles, dial up the disperse value, and the fractal field influence. And let's go with that for starters. As you can see, this box grid appears right in the middle of our ground plane, which is great. From there, I can push and pull the position of the box and resize the whole shape to fill the space. Once it's the right size, I can turn down the opacity of some of these particles so they look like just light debris. I'll also play with the fractal field settings until I like the floating speed of these particles. Once I like all that, I notice that there's this column right at the very beginning of the footage, and it'd be nice if I could have it occlude these particles. So I create a copy of the front column solid. I scale it and mask it properly, and then apply it as an inverted alpha mat. There we are. Next on our list is caustics. These are the patterns created by light passing through a water surface. They're pretty simple to generate in After Effects. Just throw some fractal noise on a solid, then alter option click to add an expression to the evolution, and put something like time times 250, so it keeps on changing over time. And then add some vector blur to this, and bam, you're in business. Now the vector blur settings depend a bit on the scale of your noise pattern, but you can always tweak both of these together until you get a result you like. I'm going to preemptively add a feathered mask around this whole thing so there are no harsh edges. Now I can take that caustic card and introduce it as a 3D element to my scene. If I know I want to align it with one of the surfaces I have a stand-in for, I could just duplicate that layer and then Alt-Option drag the caustic card to replace it. I change the blending mode to add or screen and double check that within the layer properties the layer doesn't accept lights. And this is looking pretty great. Now water is dense, so it can distort and diffract the image behind it. I found that an instance of universe heat wave can be used to create this effect. By adjusting the blur and heat size to match your comp scale, and setting the flow speed a little bit lower, you can create some really subtle distortions around the image that feel wet. I really wanted to add some underwater plants to this thing, and my solution at first was to create this bunch of seaweed using trap code mirror, putting it on a card and then kind of placing that around the scene. I came up with a better solution for this later, so I'm going to kind of skip over it for now. But speaking about adding life to this thing, how about some fish? I'd love to see some fish swim through here, and I'd like them to be at least a little bit animated. Now you could download a picture of any fish you want and like puppet tool it in After Effects if you like. But I'm going to go a step further, because I want to teach you to fish, and I want to give you a fish too at the end of this all. 
So I jump over to Sketchfab, where I found this great Creative Commons fish that was animated and uploaded by user PC Noodles. I open it up in Cinema 4D, where I can copy and paste the star keyframes to the end and create a looping animation. Then I use Riptide Pro to export the animated sequence as OBJs, so I can use them in After Effects and render them with Element 3D. Now, this fish was a really nice shape, and it was rigged, which is swell, but its texture was really minimal, and I don't want to stick you guys with this thing. So I'm going to hop into Photoshop and hack apart some fish skin onto this texture. Just pushing, pulling, cloning, using the liquify window to mold these shapes and images to the original texture map. I'm also using one of my favorite sheets, which is the smudge tool set to 100%, basically allowing you to stretch out pixels using brush strokes. So I can save this file and double check my work in Element as I go. And these eyes are a little hard to line up. I've got kind of a situation going on. There we go. So now that we're all textured up, I've got this animated 3D fish that works with Element. I'm going to give this away to you guys so you can play with it if you have Element. But I'm also going to render out a 500 by 500 sprite, so you can use it the same way that I will in the rest of this episode, using Trap Code Particular. So let's jump back over to our staircase comp, add a new solid, and apply particular. In the emitter settings, I'll set the direction to directional. Then I'll set the Y rotation to about 90 degrees. Next, I'll choose a box emitter and tweak the size a bit. Now I can move my emitter off screen to the left here. I'll set some keyframes on my particle count, so there's some particles and then none again. And I'll also increase the life of my particles so they last the whole time they're on screen. So now's a good time to drag in that PNG sequence of the fish I rendered out earlier. I can simply place it in the comp and then turn it off. Now in my particular solid, under particle type, I can select textured polygon and then for the texture, I can select my fish side view. I'll leave random loop as the time sampling mode, which means that all of these fish will loop randomly from different parts of the animation. Now watch as I increase the particle size and hit play. Fish darts. Under the emitter settings, I'll adjust the random velocity to spread out these fish more. Then, under particle rotation, I'll select a very useful tool, Orient to Motion, which will keep these fish noses pointed in the right direction. Because these fish point in whatever direction they're moving, I can get some really cool results if I scroll down to Physics, Air, and increase the spin amplitude. Now, keep in mind that these are 2D sprites, and there's a point at which they'll look wrong. But, even in a pretty high spin value, since these fish are primarily moving laterally, they really look like they're swimming. For some better overall looks, I can turn the motion blur on under the rendering settings, and turn up the opacity boost a bit. I can also go to shading, and turn shadow lits for main, on. This kind of shading gives me some very quick depth to the group, and breaks up the monotony a bit. Now turning back to my physics settings, a quick reminder that spin affects the behavior of an individual particle, but turbulence fields affect the whole group. I'll tell my turbulence field to affect the position. Then it's important to experiment with the scale of the field. The higher the value will give you a very bumpy result. I prefer to turn the scale of my turbulence fields down to around 2 or 3. Then, depending on your effect position value, the lower turbulence field scale values can result in some really nice wide swirls. Next, I'll add some color correction to these particles, just darkening them a bit, and then using my good old friend CC Light Sweep to create an artificial rim when the fish are right in front of this middle lighted area. In fact, I'm actually able to link the origin of the light sweep to the light I created earlier for shine. To do that, I'm using a little expression called the 2Comp expression, which gives you the 2D position 
of where a 3D object appears on screen. Stu Meshwitz covers this technique really well in his behind the scenes from Tank, and really is an expression that no copper should be without. Anyway, color correct to your heart's content, my friends. But when you're ready to add some zing to these fish, I humbly suggest going to your particular settings and enabling the aux system, which emits particles from other particles. If I select sphere as the type and scrub forward a bit, you can see that spheres are now emitting from the position of these fish particles. I'll create a curve for the size over life so they kind of fade off over time, even though real bubbles don't actually get smaller over life, they can't. Um, and I'll adjust the aux physics to give some negative gravity and turbulence so the bubbles kind of float up and away. You know, I'm feeling pretty good on this example, so let's move on to clip number two. Also from Pond 5, this is a beautiful cruise ship interior. I'll track the camera right out of the gate and do the same thing as before, defining a handful of planes I can use to start understanding the space. This particular camera solve only returned a tripod style result, so I don't have the true parallax I'm supposed to have here, but I can make this work. I can take a big shortcut by hopping back over to my first shot and copying over the main adjustment layers and the shine light, and then just pasting them in here. This footage is much brighter and more saturated than the previous clip, so the color correction isn't perfect right away, but, but you can see the beginning of how a template could allow you to have a lot of these first steps out of the way. I'm going to fast forward through me upping the vignette amount and darkening the image adding a glow and finally throwing a universe heat wave on top of the adjustment layer. Next, I'll repeat what I did before with form. I'll add a solid, add a form. The specifics really aren't important to follow along with here because they'll vary by your comp size, but the principle is this. Create a 3D grid of particles, disperse those particles, and then displace all of those using a flowing fractal field. Do I sound smart? I'm trying so hard, you guys. Uh, Alright, let's turn on our shine layer again and get artsy with the shine locator right in the center of the chandelier. I'll play with the shine settings until I get just the right amount of rays coming out of the mid-screen and get kind of a cool look going on here, working underwater lights and everything. And now I'm going to do something really fishy, by which I mean I'm going to create a dynamic swarm of fish that do something much more art-directed. Say some visionary out there decides he wants a swarm of fish to come spiral around this chandelier in a pretty way. Well, it turns out Trapcode Particular has an amazing tool to do just this. I touched a little bit on this in episode one. No, 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 uh, no uh, this, uh, this episode one uh, of Cheap Tricks, in which we learned that particles can flow along the path of a designated light. Now, I'm going to do just that, but with the added challenge of these particles needing to flow in front and behind the chandelier. Now, step one is creating a 3D object that stands in for the chandelier. I'll create a guide plane, oriented toward the camera and basically aligned with my chandelier. I'll draw a mask around the solid center of this fixture, and then I'll do what only an idiot would do, which is draw a really complex shape with lots of points on a single mask. I'm actually not that worried about it in this case because the fidelity of this mask isn't super critical for this comp. Uh, I'll set some keyframes for the masks on frame 1 and then jump to the end frame and slightly tweak everything. And now when I scrub from the beginning to the end, I have a pretty decent 3D stand-in card with a similar alpha. Step 2 is creating a point light called Motion Path 1. Whenever you add a light, obviously the layers react and it's no biggie. Uh, selecting a layer and double tapping A will allow you to quickly turn Accept Lights to Off. And you can do this for all the 3D layers at once if you want, if it's bugging you. Anyway, we're going to keyframe this light to fly in from off screen and then swirl around the chandelier. I'll start by sliding the light off screen, setting a quick keyframe. I can use F11 and F12 on my keyboard to pop between a custom 3D view and my comp camera. Or I can take this fun approach and switch to a top view and then enable two views horizontally. So just like in a 3D program, I can watch the framing 
and a reference view at the same time. Now this allows me to just keep inching forward and adding keyframes of this light swirling around the chandelier, adjusting the tangents along the way, and ultimately sculpting this fun shape. It's actually really aesthetically pleasing, I think. And now time for another pro tip. Uh, I'm making this 3D path for the light, but I worked really haphazardly in terms of timing. But After Effects has a great solve for this. Watch as I select all of the keyframes in the middle, leaving the first and last. Then I can right click and say Rove Across Time, which will then have AE space out these keyframes to respect the timing established by only those outer keyframes. Right now, the spacing along the whole path will be consistent. And you can see that as I alter these paths, I'm really editing the shape only, and the keyframes are automatically positioning themselves to keep a constant speed. If you wanted to, you could even turn the first or last keyframes into ease keyframes and shape their velocity. And you'd be able to work with one simplified velocity curve, even though there's many points along the way. So let's put this cool path to work. I'll import that PNG sequence of fish, and I'll use it later as a sprite. Uh, I'll need a solid with particular, and then I'll just solo these layers so we can really focus on this effect. Once I've got particular in there, for the emitter position, I'm going to use this expression, where I'm taking the position of the motion path one layer, specifically at value time zero. That means a particular will spew out particles from wherever I move this motion path to be at time zero, the beginning of my curve. Now in my particular layer, I can scroll down to the physics, open up air, and then I can select a motion path. Since I named my light motion path one, I had the option to choose from one or one HQ, which is a slightly higher quality. Now, just to illustrate what we're working with here, I'll set the particle velocity to zero for a second and just hit play. Cool, huh? Now I've got this editable motion path and the particles flowing along it. The next thing I'm gonna do is scroll down to Particular's visibility settings. I'm going to go to the obscuration layer and select my chandelier stand-in. I'll be sure to check effects and masks and then I can hide that layer and instantly, I have particles that appear to be obscured by the chandelier. Just like with my other swarm of fish, I'll keyframe the amount of particles to increase and then fall off. Then I'll change my emitter type to a sphere and fine-tune the size a bit. And now, I can preview this really cool swarm. Now I'm ready for my fish particles. So let's go to particle type and select textured polygon and set the fish as the texture. I'll dive down into the particle rotation and enable Orient to Motion, and now I can see these sprites wrap around this path in all their glory. Now these truly are just 2D cards, so there's a real strength in numbers aspect to this all. With a large enough school of fish, it's okay that some of them almost disappear on angle. The swarm as a whole is more prominent than any one flat fish. The particles per second really help shape the density of this swarm, so I'll create a bit of a curve that's heavy at first and then tapers off. This will become visible in the shape of the fish swarm as it heads in. Now this clip isn't that long, and so my original path actually demanded that the fish move too fast. This kind of speed might look great if these sprites were supposed to be birds or bats or something. I mean, remember you could do more than just fish with this kind of a thing. But to correct the speed of these fish, I ended up deleting a few revolutions of that path. Now that I've got these fish working, I want to create some lighting effects. I'll add a point light, parent it to my chandelier, and make sure it's nestled in the eye of this storm. I go to the shading settings in particular and turn shading on. And now the fish are dark in front of the chandelier and bright behind it. I can add an ambient light to fill in these guys in the front a bit. And at first my ambient light doesn't appear to be doing much unless I crank it up like crazy, which means I should probably go to the shading settings in particular and adjust the degree to which the ambient lights are affecting the particles here. Now I can adjust the lights until they're looking right to me. 
Now, I've been doing this all with particular soloed so we could really see what's going on. But watch now as I turn back those initial color corrections and effects we'd added earlier. So pretty, right? Now, just like with my other batch of fish, I can go back and play with the spin settings and the turbulence field to give this path just a little bit more of an organic bend and twist. I'll enable the ox particles again so there are some little bubbles that come off of these fishies paths. And now, really, in just a few minutes, we've got this lovely, fantastic scene worthy of the big screen. I mean, you know, it'd be really cool if I got to use this particular set of skills on a few whimsical shots from a big Hollywood movie. And then those few shots made it into the trailer so I could tell everyone about them early. Now that would be practically perfect in every way. But anyway, let's move on to clip three. Now, I want to create a surreal underwater scene out of this last piece of footage. But before I do the whole tinted blue treatment, I want to show you a couple of tricks. One is creating a reflective surface using trap code mirror. And two is using the motion of a piece of footage to generate particles. So let's start with that trick using trap code mirror. Now we've used mirror before, but this time I'm gonna show you how you can use it to create this cool watery surface. Like always, I'll start with a solid. I'll call it mirror and add the effect mirror. Under geometry, I can adjust the height and width, and then I can scroll down to this group called fractal. And this fractal is bending and distorting the plane, but if I dial it down to zero, I'm basically generating a flat plane here. Now, if I add a camera to the scene, I can circle around and show you what I mean. But now, we're gonna do something really cool. Down under material and lighting, I'll change the color to black, and then I'll scroll down to the image-based lighting, where I can assign a reflection environment map. I'll select my dancer footage, and watch now as I rotate around this plane. It's like a perfect mirror surface. Now, it's doing this by treating my piece of footage like a 360 spherical map, but I want a little more control over what this is reflecting. And to do this, I'm gonna create a copy of my footage layer, and I'll rename it Dancer Footage Reflection and apply CC Tyler. Now Tyler is an effect that allows you to repeat your image multiple times, effectively scaling it down. The reason this will be helpful to me is because now I can go to my mirror layer and set it as the reflection map, being sure to enable the effects and mask pull down. Now given this comp size and the camera settings, around 16 or 17% scale on my Tyler effect seems to be about the right zoom level to create the illusion that the plane in mirror is reflecting the image on screen. Now, as I go forward, I'll be bouncing back and forth between mirror and my Tyler effect because Tyler gives me the option to offset the center of the repeating footage, basically a way to hack into what's reflecting in mirror. For example, right now my mirror plane is kind of down on the floor and I can offset the center of the reflected footage until it looks like the ballerina is being mirrored on the floor. And now comes the really cool part. I open up my mirror layer, and if I go to the fractal settings and set the amplitude to a very low number, like one or two, there are now ripples on the ground, properly reflecting what appears above them in the footage. If I wanted to, I can rotate and resize the plane to cover the desired ground. And with the right alignment, I get this incredibly satisfying plane of water. And the really cool thing is, this is a real 3D object that would react to the camera moving around, all while reflecting your source footage. But this is a tutorial about underwater stuff, which means that right now we're on the wrong side of the water. So I'm going to open up Mirror and move this plane to the top of the screen adjusting the size and angle a bit. And anytime I want to see clearly what's reflecting in this plane, I can turn the amplitude back to zero, and I can see this more like a flat mirror. Switching to full resolution will also give me a higher quality reflection. There's a slight camera move in this, and I didn't track the camera earlier, so I'm gonna add a few keyframes to compensate for that very slight camera move. And now I've got something really cool going on. You may have noticed that if you've ever looked into a fish tank or watched underwater footage while you were filming parallel to the water surface, the
the water actually acts like a mirror, reflecting the fish in the tank or the undersea environment. And that's really what I'm mimicking here. You can use mirror to create reflective liquid surfaces in any kind of comp you like. It's a super nifty tool. So let's save this and move on to another trick. Now back to the original clip, her motion is really beautiful. And I think it could be really cool if we could enhance that motion with some particles or bubbles. Now, underwater bubbles are kind of used with artistic license. The real reason they're in most movies is because the actor just dove down into the tank and they've got a bunch of bubbles still clinging to their clothes and stuff. But sometimes you just look cool when bubbles are flying off of you like a contrail. Or when you clash some underwater tritons together, you add some magic bubbles that appear and then you kind of wuss out and fade out their opacity the way bubbles cannot. But I do like the look, it feels right. And ultimately you just want shots to feel right. So here's my thought. Since this footage is relatively static, and she's the main thing moving around in frame, we can utilize a difference mat to create regions where she's moving the most. I'll show you what I mean. I'll create a comp called Dancer Motion Detector, for lack of a better name. And in this comp, I'll place two copies of the dancer footage. One of them, I can offset by one frame, just like that, and then hide it. Now I can apply Difference Mat to this visible layer and choose layer two as my difference layer. As I adjust the settings a bit, I can now reveal just the parts of the image that are notably different from the last frame. Now watch as I play through and you should get the idea. Since the background is only changing slightly, but the dancer is moving more than that, we mostly just see the edges of her appear. I can augment this shape by adding a simple choker to eat away some of the stray pixels and then another simple choker with a negative value to bloat the remaining shapes. I'll fill these with red just to make them more visible. Now if I place the dancer footage behind this as a guide layer, it's really clear to see what's happening. My last step for creating this motion-driven layer is to create a garbage mat around the dancer so I'm just getting her changes and not, for example, the shadow over here on the wall. Now, I'll reiterate that this is working because the camera is barely moving. It would work great with a static camera, but it really depends on your source footage. Now that this layer is ready, I'll create a new comp called Dancer with Particles. I'll place my dancer footage in here, and also that Dancer Motion pre-comp. This layer I'll turn into a 3D layer, so Particular can use it as a layer emitter. Then I'll create a solid with Particular, change the emitter type to layer, and then down below the layer emitter settings, I'll select my dancer motion detector, and be sure to set the particle birth time as the layer sampling mode. I'm also gonna select none under the layer RGB usage. I'll crank up the particle count until I can see some particles and turn the velocity of the emitter down to zero for now. And quickly scrubbing through, there aren't very many visible particles, even with this pretty high particle count. And that's because, comparatively, the alpha of the dancer's edges is a relatively small portion compared to this whole layer size. So to combat this, I'm going to jump back over to my motion detector precomp and duplicate my simple choker effect a few times. And just as an aside, the simple choker effect is one that can benefit from multiple instances of the effect rather than having higher values of one instance. You'll actually get different results, and sometimes it's worth playing around with this. Anyway, when I jump back to my comp, I'm seeing more particles now. I'll adjust the size of the particles down to something that looks like a tiny bubble, and then under physics, I'll increase the spin amplitude and turn down the spin frequency. I'll also tell a turbulence field to affect the position, and turn the scale of the turbulence down. And just like when I've used Particular before, I'm going to dive into the designer, duplicate this instance, and create some larger, puffier particles that are barely visible. This will just add some volume and realism to my effect. Now, let me preview just what's being generated by Particular now. It's a really cool shape, and it's pretty much automated by that pre-comp with a difference mat. I mean, imagine the things you could do if you wanted to use some of the other sprites and particle types included with Particular. 
You may never have to do a comp with an underwater ballerina, but you might need to create a magic character who has a sparkly wake, or add some life to some sports footage, or who knows what. I'm telling you guys, the trap code suite will change your life. Now that we've created these bubbles and this reflective surface, let's combine the two. And in fact, to save some time, I'm going to pre-render it. And if you skipped ahead to this point and are wondering why we have a bubbling ballerina reflecting in the ceiling, I'm afraid you're going to have to watch the whole episode next time, Skipper. While working on this ballerina piece, I've been holding off on the other kinds of water effects we covered earlier. And that's because, while you weren't looking, I created this underwater template on my other monitor. With my right hand. And a second mouse. Anyway, I built this template for you guys. It's called the Aqua Template, and there's a lot of really cool stuff in here. Now, remember that list of what makes a scene look underwatery? This template really tries to cover all those bases. Up top, we've got a pre-comp where you can drop your footage. And once you've done that, you can open up Comp 2, Aqua Template RG. And this comp is the Red Giant Fueled Super Template. It utilizes the Trap Code Suite to help you customize your underwater look. So up top, we've got the Underwater Look Controls. It's linked via expressions to this locked adjustment layer below. Like before, I used the Pseudo Effect Maker to create a single custom control effect which allows you to alter the brightness and contrast, color and tint, distortion, blur vignette, and glow. The effect looks like this by default. And then depending on your footage, you can go through and dial any of these look controls up and down to suit your needs. You can get some great top level effects just playing around with this. Remember, it's basically controlling all the individual effects in this adjustment layer below. If you want, you can always unlock this layer and try messing around under the hood if you like. Next in our layer stack, we've got our shine position. It's a light that you can move around to any position that looks the best for your footage. It's a 3D object, so remember if you decide to motion track your footage, you can place this in 3D space. The actual shine effect along with its settings are on the adjustment layer below. Then just under that, we have an instance of form, creating some default floating particles. Now right now I'm rendering with GPU acceleration on. If you have to use your CPU, it'll be a little bit slower, and you may want to just solo this first instance of form until its final render time. Last in this comp, we've got a hidden instance of mirror. Enabling it will show you this plane that reflects your footage. Now, it's based on the size and position of the CC Tyler effect in the hidden layer below called Reflection Map. Uh, right when you turn it on, it's a little out of place just by itself, but if you solo the footage in the mirror layer, you have a jump start on creating a water surface where there was none, or to do what we did with our ballerina and create a reflective surface on the top of frame. Now, the evolution speed is controlled by an expression, and you're going to want to play with that number depending on the speed and scale of your footage. Now, below this, we've got a footage pre-comp and a default camera. And this camera is mostly here for mirror, as the focal length of the shot really affects what the reflection looks like. Now, naturally, if you camera track your footage, you'll create your own camera and you can toss this one. Also locked and hidden at the very bottom is the vignette blur map. And don't worry about it, but also don't delete it. And that covers it for the look part of this comp. But now let me show you the elements preloaded in this comp. They're all under the O3 elements folder, and they're lots of fun. First, we've got caustics. A nice big light ripple pattern that fades off at the edges. Then we've got a fish particle PNG sequence if you want to use it like in those other comps. Below that, some light beams that you could layer into your comp if you want. There are some wider ones and some tinier sharper ones. These work to look like light coming down from a surface that you can't see. Below that, we've got plants. We have four looping PNG sequences of these underwaterish plants. Two speeds, fast and slow. Now I rendered these sequences out of Element 3D based on some plant models I'd tinkered with in Cinema 4D. Now these are really quick to use as cards, but I'm also going to share my 3D files and Element pre-comps of these fish and these plants, in case you want to actually use any of them with Element 3D because of the needs of your shot. So back to the template, you'll notice this O3 Aqua Template AE, which as you might have guessed is a 100% After Effects version of the underwater template. 
It's the same adjustment layers and controls up top, and then below that, a poor man's version of Shine, using a combination of effects, primarily radial fast blur. For the floaties, I'm also using CC Ball Action. Now there's no reflective water surface option here, but if you like, Jacob Dalton has a fantastic tutorial called Fill a Room with Water, and that covers a great 100% AE method for creating a water surface if you need it. Now, using this aqua template and all of its included elements, I think you guys can crank out some really cool material. Let me show you an example. Remember that ballerina? Watch how quickly we can bring in her footage, drop it into the pre-comp, adjust the position of the shine light, tweak the color and vignette settings, and then start dropping in some of our elements like caustics. We'll remember to turn off the accept shadows option and then just position a few of them around in the lighted areas. After that, we can have some fun mixing in some of these looping plant elements, just kind of placing them around and offsetting the loop timing a bit. I'm using the slow version since the footage is slow-mo and the animation on these ones is a little bit calmer. With a little bit of brightness adjustment on these plants, I can make them great foreground elements, and a few minutes later, we've got a really fun comp. And that's going to be it for part one. Be sure to watch part two after this and learn about fluid dynamics and creating some really fun cinematic scenes on your home computer. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. So today I'm going to show you how to do this Thanos smoke portal effect with Typhlo for the little lightning and then Phoenix of D for the smoke effects. So let's set it up from scratch. It's a pretty simple setup, so I'm going to try and do it as quickly as I can. So I'm working in units, centimeters, one unit is one centimeter. We can start just by creating a torus in the middle of our scene, make it about this big. It should be pretty thin. Rotate it and raise it up. And if you sort of look at it, the, the bottom of it should be a little cut off because that's where the ground is. So we can sort of leave the bottom of it, maybe something like this, and then hold shift and drag and copy this one like that. Maybe we can raise the thickness of this. So radius two, maybe we can do 10 and move it back here. Helpers point and just make a point and then make it a box. And I like to make it some other color than green because it's the color of the Phoenix box. So let's make it maybe orange and let's align it to the Taurus. And then I'm going to link the torus to the point. And that's just because I want to be able to control the torus with the point. Then let's make our timeline longer. So 200 frames for now. And then go under material and create a new map. And let's make it a noise map. And then you can lower the high to maybe 0.6 and increase the low to maybe 0.4, which will just give you more contrast. And let's apply that material to the tour just so we can see what's going on and hit show map in viewport. And then we need to decrease the size of this to maybe five and go under, click on the torus and go under the modifier panel and add a UVW map. And you can just leave it as planar. Hit auto key and animate the face of the noise from zero at frame zero to 25 on frame 200. So now, pattern of the noise will keep changing over time like this. Turn off auto key, go under helpers, Phoenix and create a PHX source and add the torus. And then before we forget, click on this small one, go to object properties, make it not renderable, display as box. And then right click again, go to Phoenix FD properties and make it not a solid object. And then under the source, let's give the outgoing velocity maybe 75. So this is the strength of the smoke that's going to be coming out of this torus. So 75 is a value that I found to be, uh, you know, not too much, but not too little to get this kind of violent smoke. We can turn off temperature. We can raise the amount of smoke to two. And then we want to grab this map that we created for the torus and say copy and paste it into this smoke map and say instance. So basically, wherever the mask is black, there will be no smoke emitted and wherever it's white, there will be smoke emitted 
at full strength of two with 75 for outgoing velocity. So as the map keeps changing, you're gonna get this randomized sort of pattern of smoke bursting out at different points around the torus. And also set the noise here to four, which will just randomize the outgoing velocity of the smoke even more. And then we wanna go under helpers, Phoenix, and create a body force and set the strength to 1000. And for the attraction object, let's pick this small torus here. So we're gonna emit the smoke from this big torus and it's going to get attracted to the small one. And that's how we get this funnel look of the smoke going to that smaller point. So I also wanna add a turbulence. So let's do PHX turbulence. Leave it at strength 200, but with 50 centimeters for size. And then we can create the Phoenix grid. So standard Phoenix fire and smoke sim. And just make a grid like that. Grid and set Z as jammed minus so that the ground of the simulator or the bottom will act as the ground. And we can raise the Z like that. And for the resolution, one centimeter cell size right now is fine. You know, about three million total cells is okay to start. And then I raised it to about eight million from my final simulation, which ended up looking like this. But you can give it as much resolution as you want. You can leave it simming overnight if you want. So under dynamics, we can raise smoke dissipation to about 0.4. So this value goes from zero to one with one being that the smoke will instantly immediately disappear. So 0.4 will just make it sort of thin out and sort of look like it's about to disappear back here into the darkness. And then I actually left everything else at default. And then just go under output and make sure that you output velocity. I, I did render this with motion blur, which helps sell it a little bit. So just pick your path here. And then let's simulate a few frames and make sure that this is actually working. All right, so I ran this for 50 frames and everything's looking good. You can go under preview and turn on the GPU preview so you can see the funnel. Click on this torus, go to object properties and make it display as box and not renderable as well. So if I go through my timeline, this is basically our effect as it stands right now. Now, the way I rendered it, basically there's no lights back here, so the smoke just sort of vanishes into darkness. So I know that I'm making it look super easy, but obviously I've already gone through the pain of trying all sorts of different numbers to get this kind of an effect. But the numbers that I just gave you will give you exactly this effect here. So let's just say that we're happy with this as it is, so we can just hide Phoenix for now. And one more thing that I wanna do is, let's make this display normally again. And I forgot to animate it, so let's just select this control point and set it as it is on frame 50 and go back to frame zero, hit R, and just scale the torus down. So that's how we get that opening in the beginning. And then, you know, I added a quick flash of optical flares from Andrew Kramer and it lasts exactly 50 frames. So you end up with that opening just like this. And you can select the point, hit the curve editor and set the point type to auto, which is basically smooth. So it will give you a curve and it will slowly stop as it's growing. And now we're going to use Typhlo to add this little lightning sort of going through the funnel. So hit R and hold shift and drag and copy this torus and let's name it our emission torus. And you can go under materials and maybe give it a red material just so we can differentiate it and make that a little larger than the first one, so maybe four. And you can scale it down a little bit just to match the other one. Tie flow, create a tie flow object. Go into the editor and let's drag out a standard birth. And we want to emit from zero to 200 per frame. And we want to emit about 20 particles per frame. And then let's add a position object because we want to birth those particles along the surface of this torus here. So I'm gonna pick our red emission torus and we have some particles being born. 
And now we basically need to attract those particles to this small torus again, just like we did with the body force. So with Diflow, you do that by using the find target operator. So let's drag that out here. And for our target, we want to pick this small torus here. So now we have that funnel again. That's a good start, except the particles don't die. So we need to add a delete operator. And we want to delete the particles based on their age. And then you can just drag this range until you have them about where you want them. But what I actually did, I just increased the variation because I don't want all of these particles to, to reach the end because it's supposed to be sort of just flashes of lightning so the particles should some of them should die sooner than others so i just raised the variation to about 40 and maybe you can lower the range again and then maybe lower the variation a little bit so we basically want the particles to die around the time when they reach the torus back here so now our portal sort of gets born and the particles are moving along with the smoke to the small torus and then they die. Now we need to give these particles shape and make them look like lightning. So we can just add a shape operator and drag it under the find target. And you can make it 3D for now and just make it grass long, which is as close to lightning as, you, as you'll get. And then we can go under display and make it geometry. And we need to go back under shape and hit scale and maybe scale this up to 500% so we can see it. So now we have these little pieces of grass for now. And let's go under the material and go to standard V-Ray and let's do V-Ray light material and make it sort of like a cool blue and maybe with a five intensity, apply that material straight to tie flow. So now they're blue. Now they're all sort of facing the same direction. So let's add a rotation operator here. So now they have random rotation. So this is what we have right now. And what you can also do is add a spin operator and put it under rotation and maybe set the spin rate to like a thousand so that they keep spinning also on top of having a random rotation in 3D space. All right, so now let's just make something to replace this grass with. So we can go under splines and just create a line and just make a few sort of random points to make it look like lightning. And then you can just play with the vertices a little bit. Maybe delete this one. So something like that. And then let's go into rendering and enable in viewport and in render so you can see how thick it is. And that looks fine. So let's just right click and make it an editable poly. And then you can go under shape and just remove the grass and add selected. Hit the scale size again and make it maybe 10. Okay, that's too small. So maybe 20. Okay, I think that's, that's about where I was here. And a lot of these will disappear into the smoke right away. So don't worry too much about, you know, what happens back here. You're never going to see that. You're only going to see a few of these around. And, um, you know, you can always just duplicate this, make it a little different and add it in here so you have more variation. All right. So now in order for us to be able to render this out, we need to add a mesh operator down here. And now we can just go under standard lights and add a few V-Ray lights. All right, so with the V-Ray light, you can set the multiplier to maybe two and then under options, make it invisible and hold shift and drag and make one more. Rotate it 180 and then hold shift, make one more and maybe put this one on top. And for this one, you can lower the intensity to maybe one. And then let's unhide Phoenix. So we have our smoke in here. And then maybe we can go under the rendering settings for the smoke. So you would just go under rendering, volumetric options, smoke opacity. And I think I raised the opacity to maybe 0.7 just to make it look thicker. And then under smoke color, I think I made it more black. So something darker like this should work. 
And then one last detail we want to add is the blue sort of light glow on the inside. So I just made another V-Ray light. And this one you can just make a sphere. And I think I set the multiplier to about 5 and make the color blue like that and then everything will turn blue because of the GPU preview so you can go back into Phoenix go under the GPU preview and here you can click exclude and just exclude that last light and say okay so it will not be shown in the preview so not everything will be blue and then you can just move this blue light basically in the middle of that funnel so about there should be pretty good and I'm just looking at this view right now and you can just you know see where it's at so basically in the middle like that and make sure that it's invisible and now we can just come over here and for my quick rendering settings I'm just using V-Ray Next um, bucket 2 and 4 for the sub diffs and 1000 for light cache that's fine and let's give it an HD resolution and hit render and see what we get. All right, so this is the render as of right now. It's very close to what I have here. Now, obviously I added some curves and color correction and After Effects to make this pop a little more, but you do have this basic render looking pretty good. I think the lightning is a little too bright. So you can go back in the material and maybe lower this to just one. And then what you can do is go to your render settings under render elements and add a V-Ray self illumination pass, which will basically just give you a pass of just the, the lightning. So this is what that pass will look like. You will get just the lightning by itself, which then you can use the add transfer mode to add it on top of the funnel. And you can go and do effect, stylize, glow and just you know add some glow to to the lightning which can be pretty cool but I actually didn't use this pass at all because I really liked it being very subtle and not drawing too much attention to itself just a few little lightning bolts here and there but mainly the focus is on the smoke and one more thing that you can do is go under standard V-Ray and make a V-Ray plane drop it in here and then you want that to be slightly above the ground sort of penetrating the smoke a little bit so maybe like that into the grid and that will just give you a ground so that the lightning sort of isn't here on its own so you can just go back into the material and make a sort of bland gray ray material with no reflection which will just make it faster to render and apply that material to the V-Ray plane and now let's just put our camera in place and see what we get. All right, so this is very close to what was my final result. I just think that the light here gives you this sharp thing. So let's just, what you can do is move the light up and rotate a little bit just to get rid of that sharp edge and move it more sort of higher up above the funnel. And then I think that the light inside is a little too bright. So you can just select that light again and maybe let's lower the multiplier to just two and you can basically just animate your camera, run the Phoenix simulation and, and that's about it. And then when you bring it into After Effects, basically all I did was I added this optical flare in the, in the first few frames and then I cranked up the curves to give it a lot this nice sort of brighter edge so really a very simple setup so i hope that you guys will try and do this effect on your own i would love to see your results i would appreciate if you could leave me a comment you know letting me know what tutorials do you want underwater footage tends to be bluish have volumetric light both from on-screen sources and from above frame the camera is often handheld or floaty, and the motion of objects is slow. The footage is also generally murky. Things fall off the farther they are away from camera. And lastly, sometimes the image can appear wavy or distorted. 
Now how about the elements that tell you we're underwater? First, we've got our floating bits, just a bunch of little particles swirling around. We see caustics, or light ripples, that dance along various surfaces. Perhaps fish or other animals may swim by. And underwater foliage is usually sprinkled around and grows around stuff. Moving objects create bubbles that either enhance their motion or float to the surface. And to create your underwater look, you can use some or all of the things on these lists. It depends on the shot and your art direction. Now let's dive in. You're going to want the right type of footage. Pools of light in a dark, foggy environment work best. The brighter your footage is, the more challenging it may become. Daylight exteriors are a no-go. If you're using stock footage, like this awesome material provided by Pond5, you're going to want something like this. Something dilapidated might lend itself to looking like the elements have taken their toll. If you're shooting your own material, here are several suggestions. Use a darker, sparsely lit area, especially with top-down lighting. Fog machines work wonders. They can create a soupy feel and add volume to all of your lighting. Plus, they're pretty affordable. Heck, go buy one the week after Halloween when they're on clearance. Kick it on and then waft that fog around so it's more uniform. Now, all your light sources will have cool volumetric light coming off of them. Just like in water. If you want to get fancy, you could even get a projector and project caustic patterns onto everything for some practical effects lighting. This would work the best from the top down if you can manage that in your space. I'm using my garage for this demo, and so I'm lighting it from the side. But at the very least, your kids will get a big kick out of this. Film at a higher frame rate to take advantage of slow motion. It's harder to move quickly underwater, and if you have an actor involved, frankly it becomes a lot less believable if they can move around too easily. And those are the basics for getting some good material to start with. Now let's dive into After Effects and get our feet wet. I'm going to convert these three clips into some fun underwater scenes.